Hello, friends. We are in American Conversations, a program that generally appear in Spanish. I am Arturo Lopez Levy. I am professor of international relations and politics at Holy Names University in Oakland. As you know, we have a very limited audience in English, but from time to time, when we have an occasion like the one that we have today with a special guest, we try to do it also in English, trying to reach our English speaking audience. Today is a special day in American conversation because we have with us Ambassador Carlos Fernandez de Cosío. Carlos Fernandez de Cosío is a very seasoned Cuban diplomat. He had been ambassador in South Africa, ambassador in Canada. He had a very important experience in multilateral organizations working in the United Nations. And he was the head of the Cuban delegation as guarantor of the Colombian peace process uh, between the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, and the government of Juan Manuel Santos. He was one of the head of the team. There were other people like uh, famous Cuban diplomat Ivan Mora and also Ambassador, uh, who uh, regretfully is uh, deceased. He was a, a good friend of, of, of uh, Ambassador Fernandez de Cosío, and also I have the opportunity to, to meet him, and also Ambassador Rodolfo Benitez was also head of the Cuban delegation in the guarantor position of the Colombian peace negotiation. Carlos Fernandez de Cosío, Ambassador Fernandez de Cosío, had been in Washington as part of the conversation with the State Department discussing issues of migration as part of a set of agreements that began in 1980. 88 under the Reagan administration. Then it has a major watershed during the Clinton administration with agreements in 1994, complemented in May 1995, and also the uh, final agreements that happened on the last minutes of the Obama administration in January 2017. During the Trump administration, many of these achievements has, were relegated And during the first year of the Biden administration, there was no major improvement in this area. So these conversations were a watershed. They happened in, uh, on Thursday. And Carlos Fernandez de Cosío, the vice minister of Cuba's foreign relations, had agreed with American Conversation to give us some uh, insight about the issue. So Ambassador Fernandez de Cosío, uh, I would like to ask you, Uh, what is your uh, view about uh, Cuba's foreign policy today? This is a more general question. There is a new Cuba or a Cuba that is continuity and change with a new generation in government uh, after the historical revolutionary generation, a new constitution after 2019, a new Cuban immigration and a new relation between the Cuban diaspora and the country after 2019. 13 reform. Uh, there is also a new Latin America with some turn to a moderate le left, including very important President AMLO, Andres Manuel López Obrador in Mexico. But paradoxically, the U.S.-Cuba relation have no catch up yet with this new reality. What are the changes, challenges and priorities that you see for U.S.-Cuba relations today? The Cuba's foreign policy traditionally has has had as a aim to expand and to develop relationships in as wide as possible in many parts of the world, and we can say that for many years we have enjoyed and we enjoy today quite a comprehensive presence around the world, with many countries represented in Havana. Uh, we have uh, a comparatively a high, a high presence of diplomatic missions in our country. And we can say that with most countries around the world, we have not only friendly uh, relationship, but we have areas of cooperation, of mutual cooperation, sometimes received by Cuba, sometimes given by Cuba. The United States has been one, except, one exception to that. The US government has for 60 years not had the capacity or the will to engage in a meaningful respectful and civilized relationship with Cuba. It has been difficult, it seems to us, 
for the U.S. political leadership traditionally to accept that Cuba is and has the right to be a fully sovereign country and that there's no role for the United States to determine and to control the fate of the Cuban nation. If that were to be understood, if that were to be accepted, there could significant there, there could be a significant productive relationship between the two countries. Of course, understanding that there are differences in sizes, there are differences in culture, there are differences in terms of impact and footprint uh, around the world, but there could be a meaningful cooperation beneficial to both our peoples and beneficial to the peoples of the region. U.S. hostility towards Cuba and the U.S. economic blockade against Cuba has been a major problem for the hemispheric relationships and for the relationship of the United States with the rest of the region. And this is, this is not something said only by the government of Cuba. Many governments during many years have said, said, said so. They have stated it uh, publicly, and that constitutes a problem. Today's relationship from the U.S. towards Cuba is very similar to the one established by the government of Donald Trump basically in the last three years of his government, the, the, the major part of his government. Even though perhaps the, the, the level of rhetoric is not as hostile, in practical terms, and the impact of the policy in the daily lives of Cuba is exactly the same as it was during the government of Donald Trump when it chose to, to apply a policy of maximum pressure to reinforce the economic blockade and to do so precisely during the COVID pandemic when it thought that the pandemic would be its ally in trying to overthrow the Cuban government or to put the Cuban government to its knees. That's the reality we face today. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister uh, Fernandez de Cosío, for accepting to answer this question. I have another question for you. The U.S. State Department characterized the negotiation or the conversation with your between your delegation and the U.S. delegation led by Emily Mendrala, adjunct secretary for uh, the Western Hemisphere, as fruitful and constructive discussions. Uh, do, what is your take on the issue? In the note of Associated Press in which you are quoted, you seem to appear, uh, I will call it cautiously optimistic, but I don't want to be judging your, your, your take if I have you in front of me. Uh, it looks that you are, uh, I would say, a little more optimistic now than when you came to Washington. Is this a good description or not? Uh, I wouldn't want it to be boxed in any in someone else's description, but I cannot I cannot disagree with the characterization made by the State Department because the discussions were frank, they were constructive in terms of the, the level of dialogue. And in terms of the, the understanding of the problems that we have, the problem is that what we need goes beyond frankness, uh, understanding, and even agreement when there's agreement in the, in the diagnosis of, of the problem. And sometimes there was. The problem is that we need actions. We need visas to be processed and implemented and, 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 and given to migrants in Cuba. We need to stop the current scenario by which Cubans have to travel to a third country to try to apply a, a visa. And, and then in that occasion, the amount of visa granted are very small because there's a commitment of the United States since 1994 to grant every year 20,000 visas. That has not been fulfilled since 2017. So for today, you could say that 60, 70, 80,000 Cubans would have migrated legally, regularly to the United States and the U.S. could have avoided what is happening today in the southern border of Mexico if that were to be applied. So beyond our frankness, beyond the, the professional spirit and the, and the constructive spirit of the discussion, we need actions. And that is still to be seen. Thank you, uh, uh, Carlos. Uh, if the premise in both communicates, the one from the State Department and the one from the Cuban Ministry of Foreign Relations, is that both countries discuss issues of mutual concern and in the at the service of the national interest of both countries. 
can we expect that the that Cuba and the U.S. discuss other issues of mutual concern and interest? Can you mention some of those topics that you would like to see more conversations with the United States? First, let me say let me, let me say these these talks were talks on migration. That was it. Why we agreed to meet, and that is logical that we meet on that. We hadn't met for four years. When you have, in a country of 11 million, you have over a million people born in Cuba living in the United States. Communication, required communication between the two countries. You have irregular migration to the border. You have the threat of uncontrolled migration through the ocean. Of course, there's a need to talk. And that is very positive. It is very constructive. Perhaps it's not enough, but even that is a very important step forward. Now, apart from that, there are many topics On, on which Cuba and the United States should talk about. We should talk about criminal activity in our region, how to commonly join efforts or at least exchange information to fight organized crime, to fight trafficking in persons, to, tra to fight drug trafficking in our region, which is being used for drugs that go from South America to the United States, and Cuba geographically is in the middle. We should talk about many other issues. We should talk about the full impact of the U.S. economic coercive measures against the people of Cuba. But why is the reason the United States suspended remittances, which was highly criticized by the Democratic Party and by the Democratic campaign during the elections of 2020, Absolutely. and yet that prohibition is still in place? We should discuss why the U.S. prohibits Americans to freely travel to another country to travel to a neighboring country, which is Cuba. Why are Americans prohibited to engage scientifically, culturally, artistically, or simply for their own will in another country like Cuba? We should talk about why the United States has put during COVID so many impediments for Cuba's effort to, come, to, to address uh, the pandemic. We should discuss about how we could jointly help other countries in the region in the area of health, in the area of education, in the area of scientific research. So the agenda could be immense. There are, of course, some priorities, but there could be an immense agenda between the two countries. And we would hope that at some point down the road, the U.S. government would stop acting by what they themselves describe as perceptions and would stop acting about political fears of electoral nature in the United States. I think that, that what everything on the list that you mentioned that is on the interest of Cuba and the United States and the United States is applying a policy against academic exchange, educational exchange, uh, in some sense, uh, not cooperating in areas in which there are more than 22 agreements. Those policies, uh, regretfully, are not only anti-Cuban, they are of an anti-American nature. Uh, Finally, there is a very big summit coming in the hemisphere. Uh, it is announced that there will be a summit of the Americas, or at least it, it is proclaimed as such in LA this June. Have Cuba been invited to the Americas summit? How do you see the chances of adopting a hemispheric compact on migration that proclaim to address the root causes of underdevelopment, lack of alternative, climate change, political and criminal violence. Is there a, a place for Cuba there? Uh, have Cuba been invited? This is the first question that I ask. Uh, we don't know if any country has been invited yet, any other country in the region. But well, I last, last week, the vice president of El Salvador was interviewed by the Voice of America, and he said that Salvador has not been invited yet. Oh, we, don't, we don't know if any country has been invited, but I can tell you Cuba has not been invited yet. Now, if this summit is going to be a summit, a selective summit, not an inclusive summit. If it's a summit that's going to invite some countries of the region, but it's not going to invite others. First, it's, going, it's not going to be truly a summit of the Americas. Secondly, it won't be able to, to claim that it is addressing the fundamental problems of the region in the way that you describe climate change, health, uh, inequality, uh, corruption, uh, economic problems, productivity, 
democracy, human rights, if it's a selective summit. Thirdly, it will be a setback for the region. Already there are summits in Panama and Peru in, where, in which there were comprehensive invitations to countries in the region. Even under the even under the Trump administration, let's, I let's was going to say so with a democratic case. government and with a Republican government. If this government goes back and go back goes back in the line in which the OAS operates as an instrument of U.S. foreign policy in the region, it's going to be a major setback. History showed that the Summit of Americas tried to uh, remove itself from being identified exactly with the OAS, if it's going to be a summit of selectivity and not an inclusive summit, then one can think that it runs the risk of becoming as discredited as the OAS is today. Finally, Carlos, uh, do you see possibilities of a, a renewal of the type of spirit that led to some cooperation in international health effort? like the one that happened in Western Africa between Cuba and the United States in the context of the World Health Organization. Uh, do you think that this is something that it will be possible in a relatively short term? This is something that, this is something that was very well uh, appraised by the current director of the USAID, Samantha Power. Do you see any chance that the two countries facing the serious challenge for the international community that represent the spread of pandemics and the deficit of healthcare personnel and healthcare, international healthcare responses in several areas of the world, do you think that the two countries can cooperate in this area again? The reasons for that cooperation to exist are there. The, the rationale for taking advantage of the potentials both of the United States and of Cuba in the area of health specifically to jointly cooperate is also there. And Cuba has the willingness to go down that road and to engage again with the United States and try to help others and to make a difference in terms of cooperation in our region, in our immediate region, in the Caribbean, in Central America, in the hemisphere as a whole, or in other parts of the world. Unfortunately, today, that we know of, there's no willingness in the U.S. government to take advantage of that possibility. Thank you very much, Carlos. Let me tell the audience that we have the opportunity to have a conversation in Spanish. Uh, Ambassador Fernandez de Cosillo, Vice Minister, uh, he spoke in Spanish to his fellow Cubans in the diaspora. This is a, a, an element that, that we have we didn't forget but we will not repeat in English because it's already in Spanish that is our mother tongue. Carlos, has been a great pleasure to have you here, and I don't know how to thank you for the time that you have dedicated to uh, American conversations and also for the time to speak in Spanish and also in English to our audience. So I don't know if you want to say anything to say before we say goodbye, But the only thing that I have for you is a tremendous gratitude and a reminder of the good relationship that has characterized us since I met you for the first time when I was joining the Higher Institute of International Relations and you were leaving for Angola just after finishing. So uh, thank you. It's open the floor for you to say whatever you want to say goodbye. Thank you very much, Arturo. It's been a pleasure to be here. Your questions, I think, are very relevant, and the topics you have touched, I think, are relevant for the audiences, both in the United States and in Cuba and other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you to you. Bye.